40th year with CFAN and 39 years alongside Ryan. Well, of course, the last 10 years have been with yeah. Daniel, but of course, Ryan has been around, you know. You'd say you and, you and Pastor Bunky were very close friends. Yes, initially not. Initially, it was uh, we were colleagues in the ministry. You know, I mean, I I, I had a role to play, and uh, it was supportive of his work. And uh, it, it, um, by God's grace, I mean, I, I can say it now. Of course, when I joined CFAN in 1981, I joined as a, as the transport guy. You know, because that's when I, when I said to Rana the the. Holy Spirit, I feel the Holy Spirit said to me, you have a part to play in this ministry. He said, I don't need a preacher. I don't need a singer. So there's nothing. I said, oh, okay. There was a, an awkward silence. And then I said, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I know the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And then he said, okay. And I said, well, I must go. He said, well, before you go, there is one thing, but it's nothing for you. I said, what's that? He said, our transport department is absolute chaos. I said, Rana, that's my background. I know how to do that. And he said, you do? I said, yeah, I'm an engineer f f most of my life. By then I was, you know, I was only 30 something. I said, most of my life, that's, that's what I know how to do. Would you come and do that? I said, yes, I would. Okay, he said, leave it, leave it. Let's, I'm going to Norway, this was in England. I'm going to Norway, I'll, I'll call you in a week. And so during that week, I told Vanjie what happened. Uh, three things happened. I won't go into them, but they were confirmations to me that we, we would be leaving England. There was no way we were going to be there permanently. We were built in with the bricks, you know. And, uh, but things happened, and, and I could see that the, the nest was being shaken. He phoned. He said, do you still ha have the mind to come? I said, yes. So he said, okay, let's do it. And so Vanjie and I sold up everything, in, including her gold Kruger coin, which was for our retirement. We sold everything to pay our airfare to get to Johannesburg. I'd never lived in South Africa. She, of course, she's a South African, but I'd never lived there. So we joined CFAN. It was based out of, in, in Joburg. And I joined then as the guy running the transport department. Very short order, cut a long story short. Within three months, Rana came and said, come, you are now the general manager or whatever that we called it in those days. And uh, alongside him, I ran the place. And, I, and just to say this about our relationship, uh, when I joined CIF and then in 81, uh, everything was, I say, like the book of Judges. Everybody did what was right in his own eyes. I mean, it was chaos. There were like 120 staff and there was no real control. Ryan was a visionary, not a, not a manager. And so when I pitched up, I changed that dramatically and put structure in, uh, and then I put in the structure of department heads. Those department heads eventually became national directors in 10 different countries. I structured the ministry. We built the largest tent in, in the world. I mean, we built it, not had a company do it. We had an industrial site with 80 men and two engineers full-time, three engineers full-time. I oversaw that. So I, I structured all of that and then worked alongside around it in the ministry, structuring the crusades, structuring the fundraising and so on. You know, long story short. Uh, so in the beginning, that's what the relationship was. Uh, it, um, I mean, I can't speak for him, but I know from what he said that, that he saw my arrival as being some kind of, I don't know, God sent to, to, to structure the ministry, which was not going well. And I saw the anointing and the, and the call of God on his ministry, and I was happy to be a part of that, you know, it, 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 having left our own ministry, which God was blessing, but I, I could see the value in that. So we grew together in, in that way. And then, of course, you can imagine, over all those years working closely to run the ministry, ministry like that, we went through many things together. We went through thick and thin together. We went through joy and sorrow together. We went through uh, ups and downs. We went through uh, exhilarations and disappointments. And then you come very, you become close, close together. So our relationship uh, up until just maybe a few years back, when I would say, uh, when he was retired and out of the 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 daily hectic of running a, a ministry like this, we became more uh, close friends. But prior to that, we were friends and close colleagues and, and co-ministers, you know, and that's different to just being friends. You know, it's, it's much, much more. There were times when things were not going well or when I, I felt we were not doing the right thing or when he felt I had, hadn't done the right thing and we, we talked straight, you know. We, he always said, we, we, how, he used the German expression, let's talk under four eyes. I said, what does that mean? He said, that's a German expression for face to face. And we would talk it out and 
it, it, it would come out. So we became very, I, I said now at his memorial, I said, I, I know Reinhard Bontke better than I've ever known any other man on earth, you know. And so it, it, we, we grew very, very close. And in later years now, uh, with him out of the, the, the thrust of the daily ministry, our relationship was more uh, old colleagues, but good friends, close friends, I would say. And, uh, you know, that, that was wonderful. But I think the, 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 the peak of our relationship was in the height of the ministry as, as close colleagues working hand in hand and also uh, with the respect of good friends, hmm. you know. Would you say that Reinhard Bonnke was a man of prayer? Reinhard Bonnke was very much a man of prayer. Very, very much a man of prayer. And in fact, uh, in the very early days of our crusade work, the, the, we didn't have a departmental structure in the crusades. I put that in. There was only one department, there were two departments. One was an organizer, because I mean, that's a no brainer. There was a guy and he had to organize everything. And then there was only other, one other department, which Reinhardt instituted, intercessory prayer. That was the first one. And Suzette Hutting was the one that came in. She was a young girl, only been saved for two or three years. And she grew up under Reinhardt and I actually. And he, that was what he, he said, we have to have people pray. And intercessory prayer was for weeks and weeks before the event. It was uh, during the, the, the crusade, people praying 24 hours a day and right through the meetings. And Reinhardt was very, very much a, a man of prayer in that sense. But having said that, he, an interesting thing, he was, he's an evangelist. He was an evangelist. I guess he still is an evangelist. Uh, uh, he, he, um, when when we, it came time for crusade, uh, the, the, the style in those old days was fasting and prayer while the crusade was on, you know. And I was quite surprised when Reinhard said, no, no fasting and prayer. And I, I thought, Reinhard, he said, we have intercessors to pray. For us, this is, it's too late to fast and pray. We must eat and work. This is time to preach the gospel. And I thought, dang, he's right. <laughs> he's right. And that was it, you know. So on crusade, um, he, he, he would pray in, in the afternoon. I would join him when I could. I was off, very often I was running around like a blue-tailed fly because, you know, we didn't have the structures we have today. And I pretty much did. I, a lot of stuff fell on my neck, let me put it that way. And so if not, I would go to, he would have a little trailer, caravan, we called it a little trailer that we'd live in. He would live in, we all lived in containers and whatever on the crusade site. And uh, he would pray all afternoon, you know. And that was sac sacrosanct. Prior to the meeting, nobody should even knock on his door, you know. And I would join him for, for not much, but maybe an hour or two of that, every, every day. And, uh, and that, yeah, he was a man of prayer. He believed in prayer. How would you describe his preaching? Ronald's preaching, um, I, I would describe his preaching by saying that I have, have observed this and I've heard others observe this, including people like Daniel Kalenda and many others who've said, we thought we grew up in the church, we've heard hundreds of sermons, we've heard many evangelists, but until hearing Reinhard Bonke preach the gospel, we realize we've never heard the gospel preached. And many have said that. That was my own experience. My wife, she categorized it well. She said, how many gospel messages have we heard around it preach? Hundreds, no, maybe even thousands. She said, and every time I still want to get saved. I thought, you know what? She's absolutely right. Me too. You know, I mean, and, and I, I could, I know his sermons off by heart. I've heard them, well, hundreds for sure, maybe even thousands of times. And I still. When I hear them, I still want to get saved. And, you know, that's, uh, that's a gift. That's a gift. Simple, straight, but great communication, you know. So who would you say influenced his life? Well, um, I, I, uh, no question, by his own word, a, a, a huge influence, although the man himself didn't even know it until later years, a huge influence in his life was T.L. Osborne. Um, not so much in what T.L. preached or said, but by what he did. T.L. was one of the earliest evangelists to go to Africa in, in our period of time. Uh, actually, I, d I think Ronald only ever, I don't think he ever even got to one of his meetings because T.L. was quit 
by the by the time Ron had got going. But um, he went and he did crusades, mass crusades. You know, T.L. had his own, he's like a hippie, you know, and, and, and uh, I don't know how he preached. I never actually, there were no recordings in those days. And I don't think Ron had uh, actually ever uh, heard him preach or that, but what T.L. did was a great inspiration to Reinhardt. And uh, he, he, um, he said, when I saw that, I said, I can do that. You know, I can do that. God helping me, I can do that. And uh, so I, I think that's probably the single biggest um, influence. There, have, there were one or two others um, that influenced the, the, um, uh, his message, but not greatly. Reinhardt was quite interesting in that he came out of the German s situation where there was no great preachers at all, really, to speak of from that period of time. Church was very, very tiny. The Pentecostal movement was was very small, actually still quite small. And uh, he came out of that with, uh, uh, himself weighted down with the old Pentecostal traditions, you know. And I personally watched Reinhardt th shake those off, you know, and, and, uh, and, and change his preaching to straight in the face gospel message, the blood of Jesus Christ, pray for the sick, pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Nobody was doing that. In fact, many of our own Pentecostal brethren opposed him for that, you know. They didn't like that. Praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit in public, for many they said this is not right, you know. And, but I saw Reinhardt, and, and this was a work of the Holy Spirit, restructure and structure how he preached and how the Crusades ran, really Himself, I know that was the Holy Spirit, yeah. but, but uh, we tried, did things, if they didn't work, he would drop them. But it was not trial and error. Mostly, he said, I feel this is what we should do, and it worked. Yeah. Time and time again, it worked. Yeah. So I think that was pretty much a sovereign communication with God, you know. Yeah. And it was not, not through hours of prayer, although he prayed for hours, but it was, it was, um, it was this part of this thing that we talked about earlier of, uh, uh, feeling connected spiritually mm -hmm. with Jesus through the Holy Spirit all the time, you know, because we would be, we would be in a restaurant somewhere, you know, and, and eating the hamburger or something, you know, not, even, not thinking anything spiritual or even we were we, talking crusade or whatever, and then Ron would say, I just thought of something. I just thought of something. And he, he, he would, it would be a problem that we couldn't find a solution to, a spiritual problem or something to do with the way the, the, the messages were structured. He said, I just thought of something. This is what we'll do. And I'd listen, I'd say, that's, that's brilliant. And then we'd carry on eating the hamburger. And that would go on for 20 years yeah. What out of that discussion. Just walking with God. It's like a continual process, you know. Yeah. And, and, you know, that, that led me to one of my pet things now. And, I mean, it's, it's not uh, original to me, but Rhino uh, displayed that. Uh, the, I, I reject, if that's the right word. Yes, I, I, let me say, I reject the idea of separating spiritual and secular. You know, we in the church do that, you know. It's, it's uh, uh, come ye apart and be separate from them, you know. Touch not the unclean thing. They're all incorrectly, that's incorrectly used. And, and then uh, I, it, it came to my mind, uh, my attention when I f learned about the um, Barna Institute here in California, the Church Growth Institute. They do statistics on the churches. And uh, when I arrived in America, I needed to find out about the church in America. I read all their, a lot of their stuff. And he read, he wrote something, George Barna wrote something which stunned me. It's like 20 years ago. He said, their research shows that People who get born again, or he didn't call it that, it's the people who join the Christian church uh, in America, that within one year of joining the church, they only have one unsaved friend. And I thought, that is exactly the opposite to what Jesus said. He didn't say, don't go near the unsaved. He himself was reviled. They said, look at this guy. He eats with sinners and prostitutes. What's the matter with him? And actually, he wants us to do the same, to be salt of the earth. You know, Paul said it over and over again. Paul went to the Gentiles, the unclean, uncircumcised lot, you know, with their awful paganism. He went there. And so th this whole idea that's, I think it's maybe come out of the Catholic and Orthodox Church world that the secular and the spiritual must be separated. I, dis I reject that. Reinhardt never did that. He, he never did that. Did he when, have hobbies? So again? Did he have some hobbies? He, he, it's a joke, that, actually. He never had. Rand was so focused. He never had a hobby. We were on a television program together not that long ago. And 
the, the, the interviewer was talking to us both, and he said to me, Peter, I, I see, they, they'd seen the notes. He said, I see your hang glide, you fly hang glide. Said, yeah, yeah. And I got excited, as I can. I fly hang glide, okay. And anything else? Yeah, I love to catch fish. Oh, okay. He said, do you do a lot of it? I said, well, not that much, because we're so busy, you don't have much time. Okay, okay, that's great. Then he turned to Reinhardt. This is a fact. It was on television. He said, and Reinhardt, do you have a hobby? And I knew Reinhardt had no hobby. And Reinhardt, he, he's never stuck for words. He, he waited for a moment and he said, I like to read the newspaper. <laughs> I could see the interviewer going, oh, and it's all he did, you know. He was so focused. That's crazy. Later in life, he got a motorcycle. Oh, yeah. He bought a big BMW and he rode it. And uh, I, I would call that a hobby, yeah. although he didn't do it much. Mm -hmm. But all the years, he, never, he was so so focused.